Yeah. Source sheet uh, is there. We have uh, the blessings of the Torah. Take it away, everybody. Go ahead. Okay. The the parsha this week is parsha Tzvia, and we're not going to be talking about it. We're going to talk about Pesach because I think we need a couple of weeks to prepare for Pesach. And this is my only uh, this and next next Shabbat morning is uh, are the only two times to, to learn about Pesach together for me. I know the Rabbi Dan teaching on Tuesday night. Um, the source sheet should have been placed into the Zoom area. There's also, uh, it can also we can, it can put the, uh, the chat as well. We can put the, uh, the link by the chat area. Okay. 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 Let's look. So, uh, starting off with uh, with source number one, just a little framing of of, uh, of the Haggadah, a little framing of the like the work of the Haggadah, and begin. I think I started this source, these two sources, uh, for at least the last five years. It's like I think an important way to understand. What I think the rabbis were pointing to with, with the, you know, with the Haggadah. There's no Haggadah for Sukkot. There's no Haggadah for Shavuot. There's no Haggadah for Tisha B'Av, for Purim. There's no such thing. The Haggadah is a unique phenomenon with Pesach, even though there are other Haggadot, you know, maybe Tu B'Shvat has a Haggadah because the rabbis in uh, the 16th century the, in Svat decided there was a Seder for Tu B'Shvat. But we don't have um, Haggadah as, as a unique literary construction appearing in any other form except around Pesach. And there's a good reason for that. Um, I think that we'll get to that in a second. But let's look at what um, Mircea Eliade says about ritual storytelling in sacred time and why it's so vital. So in understanding what ritual is or what mythic time might be also, um, he wrote, in imitating the exemplary acts of a god or a mythic hero, or simply by recounting their adventures, the, the, the human of an archaic society detaches themselves from the profane, from profane time itself and magically re-enters the great time, the sacred time. And, and more importantly, he says in the second source, that in certain highly evolved societies, the intellectual elites progressively detach themselves from the patterns of traditional religion. The periodical re-sanctification of cosmic time then proves useless and without meaning. But repetition emptied of its religious content necessarily leads to a pessimistic vision of existence. When it is no longer a vehicle for reintegrating a primordial situation, that is, when it is desacralized, cyclic time becomes terrifying. It is seen as a circle of forever, forever turning on itself, repeating itself to infinity. What do you think he meant by that? Let's, we can stop there for a second, just to like focus on that. I think we every year we, we look at this source. W what was it, what's the point of these two sources? Why did I bring them? Why did he write them? Without a reason for doing something over and over again, it becomes hellish. It's a Kafka-esque prison. Right, but it, but let's 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 say, Paul, without doing doing something for no reason can become hellish, it become right, become dehumanizing, it becomes just a. But I, I'm not sure Eliade is just just lamenting doing something with a reason. Like you can do something over and over again, but the reason you give to it, he said, also matters. Meaning, like if you give a desacralized reason for doing something over and over again. Like the Seder, like a, let's say, let's take a humanist perspective on the Seder, for example. Like, you know, we, we have, we, we study Jewish history, we recognize the reasons behind start, you know, a Seder and so on. We say, okay, I'm doing it because, right, every year we're gonna do it, right? Is doing it every year 
in uh, what he says, for intellectual elites who progressively detach themselves from patterns of traditional religion, right? Is there something else besides, like, yes, doing them without a reason, but what is the reason he's pointing to? Let, let, let's say it this way. You're right. It can become hellish if you do something over and over again. The Sisyphusian kind of, right, becomes hellish. What, what, what else is he, is, he, is he trying to say, too, about the cyclical nature of time and about why we engage in something that seems to be, right, a recognition of a pattern of cycles of here we are again, here we are again, here we are again. What is that, let's say differently, why does that matter and how does that help? What he would call a trans-historical meaning to things. It's a piece that I didn't bring before this where you would essentially argue that when you have no longer have a trans-historical meaning for the events of your life, you have nothing beyond. Yeah, Beth. It's the magical re-entry that matters, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. When we allow ourselves to step into the present moment, we're also stepping into the eternal all at the same time. We're stepping into past, present, and future simultaneously when we do that. And when we do our rituals by rote, it strips it of that magic. Uh, uh, ten years ago, I, I attended a Seder at the home of an Orthodox rabbi. His wife was a friend of mine. And, you know, this guy's a rabbi. And the way they went through Haggadah was just like, now we do this, and now we bench, and now we at blah, blah, blah. And it was stultifying. And it wasn't a free-flowing discussion, and we weren't entering the spirit of the storytelling. So in spite of the fact that the traditional form was being preserved, we didn't have the magic. Debarti. Shamati. I'm going to take issue with it in a second, but I love it. Yeah. parts of what you said I definitely agree with, and there are parts that I disagree with. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I distinguish between the the Passover Seder, the reenactment, which which is cyclical, and the historical event of the Exodus, which is which is, a, is not cyclical, even mm. though we're react we're reenacting it and re-experiencing it. So for me, that's the the you need to re-experience it, it in a way where it's not which is not cyclical. If that makes sense. Hmm. Okay. So, so, wow. Okay. Very interesting. Like the, I think it's exactly the opposite of one piece of it, and exactly the same as another piece of what he was saying. In that, and this is to both of you. Then I'll, I'll go to Thomas, and then, we'll, and then maybe I don't. I can't see if there's anybody in the in the Zoomagog also. I'm not sure, but I think that he was arguing. Like, let's just imagine, for example, in mythic, mythic time, in mythic time, cosmic time, he calls it too, that you are, you arrive at the place that your ancestors were, and it's not a play as if. You're not saying, we, we're, you know, now it is this moment, but it isn't the eternal now, it's the eternal then. In other words, they believe that there are circuit, there are cosmic moments that, that as we reenact them, we are not playing acting this moment. It is an actual re-immersion in that original primordial cosmic, what do you call cosmic time. This is a cosmic template. It's almost, might, if you study philosophy, it might be platonic, and you want to think about it that way, but I don't think exactly it's the same thing. But similar, that you're arriving back at a form that we re-immerse ourselves in, not as a game, but because it is actually happening in this moment. This moment is just layered, and when you say layered on, it is that moment too. And what he would add is that if you don't see it as a sacred opportunity for renewal, but just believe in cosmic time, meaning just believe in circular time, then you're trapped. And then you feel as if you're, there is no purpose. You're just literally just over and over again, like there's Big Ben, there's Parliament, you just go around and around in a circle, it never ever ends. But what, what he would argue is, is that to re-immerse yourself in cosmic time and to be refreshed by cosmic time is to, is to not be trapped. But we also might add a twist to it. A Jewish twist would be 
that the circle becomes linear in that when you add something from the present moment, as it were, and also when you have some space between it, it's not exactly identical with, with what was, but it still participates in what was. There's a participation, like a, a participation mystique. You're actually getting the benefits of cosmic time's reinfusion to the present moment of something greater than you, transhistorical, and that you add your own present moment as a unique experience of linear time. And so I would argue with you, Beth, that when, you, when you're sitting in the house of, of an Orthodox, it's funny to use Orthodox, or anyone who uses ritual in a very, uh, you know, lobotomized way and just does it, you know, by rote, rote ritual, rotual, then you, you are not, you are, um, you're right, they're, they're losing the magic that is present when you add your flavor to it. But to the extent that someone is, you know, deeply believes that this moment is the same moment as the moment of our ancestors, right? Then that's sufficient in terms of experiencing, like, it's not, it's not sufficient. It's, it's necessary as a part of the ritual in a way that maybe if you make it a great story, but you don't really believe that this moment is actually the same as the moment that, came, that, that our ancestors experienced, it, you know, would not qualify for Iliade as like level. And this is the, I'm going to go to Thomas in a second, but this is the, the source, source three. If you look at source three, this is the brilliance of the Haggadah. And why the Haggadah, I think, is so unique to Passover. The Chodor Vador, we know this from the Haggadah, this is straight out of the Haggadah, but really it appears for the first time in the Mishnah. The Chodor Vador, Chayav Adam Lerot, Etat Smoke Ilu Hu Yatsami Mitzrayim. Shne Amar Vigata Levin Chava Yom Ahu Lemor Ba'avur Ze Asad Anai Li Betzaiti Mitzrayim. In every, each and every generation, a person is obligated, chayav adam, chayav means to be obligated, to see themselves as if they themselves left Egypt. And then the rabbis use a rabbinic way of understanding that. They don't quote Eliade, wasn't alive yet. But they say, it says in the verse, in chapter 13, verse 8, in the book of Exodus, Vigata Bincha, you will tell your child, on that day, ba'avur ze asad for this, did God bring me out? Did it for me? <coughs> the rabbis use kind of a very precise reading of what, we, what is ostensibly a quote, right? When your son asks you, what, what's this all about? You say, that our, it says in the Bible, God did this for me. The rabbis read that as, God did this for me literally. The person has to say, God did this for me literally. The Rambam goes, so, goes you know, even further. The Rambam says that you're supposed to show yourself. Har did that smoke. You have to show yourself. In other words, in the Sephardic traditions, they would actually enact leaving. That's why, you know, some people walk around the table and they, mm -hmm. they put, you know, we're leaving, right? That's why, that's what, you know, when African-Americans imagined and they, and they took the story for themselves as this is their story of Exodus. They were saying, this is our story. When Soviet Jews were imagining themselves being liberated from uh, the Soviet uh, gulags, it was this story that was their story. And so it's both, you know, the, the litmus test is that, you know, on one level, we'll get to this in a moment. I want to talk exactly about what Beth was saying about how you make your Seder come alive and how vital that is. And also the prerequisite for Iliade is like checking your boxes. Do you believe that Jewish history or human history, but let's say for Jews, because this is a Jewish moment, is, is Jewish history a repetition compulsion? Do we get to do these things over and over and over again? And do we want to rid ourselves? Like part of the progressive moment, like Freud's idea was that you repeat history over and over again until you get it right, and then you move forward without it. <laughs> you undo its, you know, its, its effects on you. Or in other words, it's, it's something horrifically wrong is, going, is happening when you are repeating the past over and over again. Right? That's kind of a presumption of Freudian uh, psychoanalysis. Or like, you know, the, the presumption is that what was not finished, it becomes finished through an unconscious repetition of the past until it becomes conscious, and then you're like, okay, whew, I'm done. But that's not Eliade's, right? He would say, we don't like keep working out the Passover story until finally we're done with the Passover story. Yeah. We don't keep working out Sukkot until we're done. Sukkot, is, these are all templates for Jewish history. Now, some people would hate that. Like, that's exactly the problem people will say. You keep thinking that everywhere you go, there's another Holocaust. Everywhere you go, there's another Pharaoh. Everywhere you go, there's another story. And that this becomes a template that is the presumptive 
you know, part of the way that we recreate the, the world that we then receive and say like, oh, you see? <laughs> and it's like, we don't recognize that we ourselves are projecting that into the world. Like the whole world is just another Passover story waiting to be re reenacted. But like, we, we think it is. We think that the Passover story is very much a part of Jewish history and that we arrive at the 14th day of Nisan and we're like, oh, we're about to leave Egypt again with our ancestors. So I just want to stop there because we're going to go. I want to go in because of that. I want to see a, the way uh, at least it plays out in a number of different moments in the Seder and how the same symbol can mean both the present and the past and also the present and possibly the future. So, okay, yeah, Thomas. Oh, I just wanted to add, I'm so happy to see Marcia Eliade here because he's beloved by certain types of architects um, mm -hmm. because he wrote this book, uh, The Sacred and the Profane. And, and not the profane in the sense of profanity, but, you know, the extraordinary and the ordinary, the, 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 the sublime and the humane, however you want to categorize those. And the first chapter of that book, which I recommend to everyone, is about sacred and profane space, which is the complement of sacred and profane time. And what's wonderful about that chapter is he never defines sacred space or profane space. He kind of stays away from the extremes. And his area of interest, which has certainly informed mine, is the threshold, is the in-between, is we know that there's such a thing as the sacred, we know there's such a thing as the profane, but we don't always know how we go from one to another. It's like going from dreaming to waking. Um, and so the dilemma of the transition, and um, he's obsessed with doorways and thresholds and openings Ooh. and, and the, 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 the interstitial. And so obviously you think of the blood on the doorway, right? The, 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 the marking of the threshold. And, and this impossible transition between one state and the other. And spatially, it's a bit wild, but he talks about the visual field. And he says the horizon is the axis of the profane. Um, that is, uh, you know, the way that somehow our visual field is more horizontal than vertical as human beings, the way we move through the world. Um, something about the earth. The relationship between the earth and the sky, the horizon is the ordinary world, the, the, the very important profane world. Um, but anything that crosses the horizon in the visual field that you, you see both against ground and against sky teaches you how to cross that threshold visually. Um, so, you know, a mountain, a tree, uh, a waterfall, um, um, Jacob's Ladder. Um, um, so, but that vertical axis teaches you how to cross in space between the sacred and the profane in the horizontal realm in which we are stuck as humans. Um, so it's about the visual, about the embodied, the relationship between the optic and the haptic. Um, it's really informed my thinking in that chapter, the sacred and the profane, but the horizontal axis and the vertical axis. So let, let's come back to that that cross. Yeah. <laughs> just, I just to add. It's the holy cross. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the we holy, can add some diagonals. Yeah, we can have the diagonals in there because the mezuzah is on the diagonal actually, yeah, yeah. and that's why you know it is that that and the it it, it actually in some ways this helps explain. This is the deepest answer to why the Haggadah appears specifically around Passover because Passover is the interstitial moment between. The Jewish people as slaves and like the pre-Jewish people, the pre-Israelite nation, and their formation as an Israelite nation. Mm. And so in time, the, in, in the temporal plane, that Passover then also becomes the place where we slide into, right, in, imperceptibly maybe, into becoming the people that we became. From the right, one expression in, in time as a, as a group of uh, of slaves without a leader, without a sense of purpose, without a sense of meaning, with a with a lineage kind of in that sense, but not with a sense of purpose, a sense of direction. And Moshe provides that and the story itself provides that. And it becomes this becomes the most important moment in the Israelite, ancient Israelite nation. It didn't matter if you were Jew or non Jew, if you lived in Israel, you participated in Passover. Everybody was invited to Passover. It became a formation moment. And as such, it also becomes so vitally important in the Christian, right? The Christian narrative, Jesus replaces the Paschal app offering. This becomes the doorway. Literally, the doorway is used. It's also metaphorically the doorway where the Jewish people enter, ex exit one identity and re-enter to a new identity. And the storytelling is, is also that. And you'll see it also plays out in the most important symbol of, this, of the entire Seder and the entire, I guess, of the whole holiday, which is Chametz. 
and matzah. Let's look at chametz and matzah as exactly this thing, exactly this moment. We're going to offer three teachings on matzah, three teachings on matzah, and before we even even look at it, I just want to say that the difference between matzah and chametz in language, which of course is the most another element of that, which is language, it's a vital, vital, um, you know, essential element of Passover is speaking, and we'll get to that in the next set of sources. And speaking reality, speaking truth, speaking itself. And you'll see later, I can say it now, that even there, that in Jewish history there was a moment where people said the word Pesach has the word mouth in it, pe, even though it means to jump over in, in biblical Hebrew. The playful reading of it throughout Jewish history was Pesach is the mouth that speaks, the speaking mouth. And so you'll notice also that speech and silence are also, you know, interstitial and it's all a part of the same theme. But if you think about Hebrew language, the word matzah and chametz share two letters with one letter that distinguishes them. In other words, chametz and matzah are almost absolutely exactly identical to one another. Right? Think about the word chametz, matzah. You have the mem tzadik, are the two things in common. Right? Ma, mem tzadi is ma tz, right? And you have it, but in, in chametz, which is leavened product, it's at the end. And in matzah, it's in the beginning, right? So they're mirror. They're mirror, they're mi- image. And then one letter distinguishes the two of them, which is the chet versus the hey. Yeah. Right? So it's the order and then one letter. And in that one letter, just to give you a sense of what of what Thomas was, was referring to, how brilliant it is, uh, you know, how does this work? I don't know. It's who knows. But chametz, the chet is the eighth letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and it's shaped like a like a doorway. Huh. Mm-hmm. It's literally a door. It's literally a door. The chet has a has two posts, and then um, uh, lentil. a lentil. lentil, literally a lentil and two posts. That's a chet. Mm. Chametz is a doorpost. Matzah is exactly the same, right? If you look at a hay, there's no difference between a hay and a chet. The hay is the fifth letter, the chet is the eighth letter. What's the difference between a hay, a hay and a chet? If you look at a hay, it also has two posts, mm. right? And then it has it has uh, a lentil. But then over here in the corner, there's an opening. Mm. It has this opening, right? It actually breaks through the doorpost, as it were. And so matzah is like first of all, just to think that the the, the space between chametz and matzah is 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 nothing. It's not. It's a little space. Number one. Number two. Chametz. What's it between chametz and matzah in time? Nothing. Right. You have eighteen minutes until the matzah will rise, and you have to make sure that you cut it off at eighteen minutes. But if one more second, <laughs> one more second, and it begins to rise, and you don't want it rising. And so it's not like it's not. We don't eat dough. <laughs> we eat matzah, and matzah is in, almost indistinguishable from chametz, except it's imperceptible. But it's like there's there's a difference, but it's in, almost imperceptible, right? It's, it's a remarkable thing just to, to double down on what Thomas was saying about the the about Iliade's distinction between the vertical and the horizontal and the sacred and the profane. Like chametz and matzah, if one is sacred and one is profane, the, you know. Mm-hmm. It starts at some point, but exactly when they had to put it at a time. But like, it's remarkable. And even matzah is extra horizontal. It's extra horizontal. It doesn't have any lift. Exactly, it refuses verticality. Um, hey, Rabbi, Rabbi David, sorry for interrupting. Um, I've gotten a few requests from the chat to move up the source sheet, please. Oh, okay. We haven't gotten to anything else. Okay, okay, there you go. Thank you. Got it. Thank you. So. It's remarkable just that, because we're not in the sources yet, we're, just, we're still back in, in, outside in, in Tomas's source and, and the rest of the conversation. Like, if we think about it, one of the, one of the most famous midrashim in, 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 the, in the Pesach anthology is that at the time of liberation, the angel said, what's the difference between the Jews and the Egyptians? These guys are idolaters, and these guys are idolaters, right? It's like a, a well-known... Like, look, like there's something obviously of distinction. There's something about Passover that obviously is so formative, and we're. But there's also the reality that that the hair's breadth between um, the door and 
um, what it takes to be free because they had to leave the door. Mm. Like matzah is the, like the almost the opening in the door. Mm. Like you know, you start with the, the, you know with the door and then you you go through it, mm -hmm. right? You have to leave. So let let's let's look at some some other meanings around matzah. So it would it of course make sense if matzah is the, one of the, one of the core elements of the Passover story that it would also have at least two, if not more, distinct meanings. Look at source, um, look at source 10. It's on page three. Yismach, the Yismach Yisrael says, Matzah, all the lessons from Matzah relate back to the idea of humility, it is meant to banish arrogance from our lives and all the husks which take hold of us when we are eating. As it says, lest you have eaten, you're full, and your heart is lifted up, and you forget God. Mm. This is a well-known theme in matzah. It appears early on in the Zohar, but it's based upon the notion that matzah represents like a leaving from Egypt. It's not just the bread that we ate when we were in Egypt. But it represents something that you're like you leave Egypt and you just you, you don't have time. You don't have time for anything else. You, you, in other words, there's no time for something to rise, and the rising of the bread becomes transformed in meaning from something delicious to something extraneous and superfluous, something not necessary. So matzah becomes representative of humility, of being simple, of being you know unadorned. <laughs> in the Zohar, it becomes called the bread of faith. It's michla dinem nusa means the bread of you eat faith because matzah is like super simple. You don't have time to rise means like, you know, you take what you got and you trust God. God gives you this, that's what you take. Mm -hmm. So matzah becomes transformed from the bread that represents our affliction, which by the way, it's called lechem oni. It's a, it's, it's, it's poor person's bread, the bread of affliction, the bread that we ate when we were in Egypt as slaves. Right? There's even an Eben Ezra in, in the Middle Ages that says that we ate, the, why is it called poor person's bread? Because anybody knows that if you eat matzah, you don't have to eat anything else for like 10 days. <laughs> so a poor person doesn't know if they're going to have any food left, so they take a bite of the matzah, it fills them up, they put the rest of it on the side for later. It's like that's, matzah becomes a representative of our destitute, how bad it was. We didn't have croissants in, in, in Egypt. Huh? We only had poor person's bread. But in the mind of the rabbis, this Lechem oni, this bread of affliction, which is the way we begin the Seder, right? Halach ma'anya is the beginning of the Seder. This bread of affliction, this bread of ani, of oni, right? This bread that is so impoverished, it's just water and flour. This bread is transfigured itself into the meaning of its exact opposite. It's not the bread of affliction, but the bread of freedom, the bread of faith, the bread of like, I'm leaving... I don't need to take anything with me. Who needs the rest of that stuff? I got my bread, and my, I got my water and my flour, and that's it, that's all I need. It's amazing, right? Mm -hmm. It also, I'll give you another example of how it's transfigured. Yeah, um, Wendy. Two things. Number one is that the, in the, during the first and second temple, the, the daily mincha offering was unleavened bread. Right. It was, it was always unleavened. As, showing that it was pure and unadulterated. We're going to come to that in a second. Okay. And and also I had to mention the fact that like for 1,200 years, the way Jews celebrated Pesach during the temple times versus the last 2,000 years is, is so different. But the one thing that stayed the same is repeating the story to your children in both. Yes. In both instances. The story is like, you know, everything else can change, but the story remains like th that act was like a principal act of Passover, right. telling the story. The God to the Bincha, that's what it says, to tell your children. So I just want to say one more, one more two more um, understandings of matzah, and the last one will be very much connected to Wendy, but I just wanted to look at one of my favorite transfigurations of that moment. Uh, so... In the book Tzitkada Tzadik, in the in the writings of the um, of Rav Tzadik Akon from Lublin, um, Rav Tzadik writes in source eleven, source eleven. 
says, you want to know another way to understand matzah? It's not poor person's bread. It's, it's, it teaches us something profound. It teaches us that when you begin to serve God, when you begin to serve God, you have to serve God bichipazon. You have to serve God in a rushed way. And we'll understand, what does rushed mean? He says, just like Kemosh Matzin Bepesach Mitzrayim, we, he says there's a distinction between the Passover in the Bible and the Passover in future generations. Just notice this interesting, another two faces to, to Passover. What, what's the, on, on Passover night, we have, um, there's a mitzvah to go all night, or as late as you can, right? We even have a story in the Haggadah of, of the rabbi, five rabbis who were in B'nai Brak. They, were, they, were, they went all night until the morning, until their students came in and said, it's, you know, it's morning, it's time to say the Shema in the morning. So you can see from that that there's something about Passover night in the future generations, not the, one, the actual night of Passover that took place in the Bible, but every subsequent Passover, what's known as Pesach Dorot, the Passover of future generations, has to be schlepped along. We schlep it out. We're not in a rush at all. If anything, everybody, that, everybody wants us to rush, but we, we don't rush. We go slowly. But... Passover in Egypt was, or the first Passover was extremely fast, right? We had to run away. So Rav Sadek says, you know what? That teaches us something. That matzah that we made when we were running away, it represents the, the first moment when you're serving God, right? In the beginning when you're serving God, you should, you should, you should, chaparayim, as they say in Yiddish. You have to hurry up. If something opens up, you take it, you know, get out. Like so you begin a new habit. Later on, he says, you can schlep it along. Right? You can be bred. But in the beginning, matzah comes to represent the ability of a person to, to, to be free enough to change something in a moment. As soon as the moment arises, you grab it and you, and you, you don't wait a second. You hurry up. You go. Mm. So the second meaning of matzah is like it means freedom, the freedom to change on a dime, to be flexible, to be able to, right? How did matzah become that? It's amazing. Like That's what he, he did with it. And now the third, the third interpretation before I open it up, and it very much relates back to Wendy's point, which is anybody who knows about the, the story of matzah in, in the Bible knows a couple of problems with the traditional understanding of matzah. The first one is that when God commands us in chapter 12 of the book of Exodus to eat matzah with the Paschal lamb, that command was already given to us in the land of Egypt. We didn't rush yet. So the reason we're eating matzah because we rushed out of Egypt is not... We were already told we were going to eat matzah with the Paschal offering. It wasn't like the historical reasons given to it seem to be out of, out of um, they're not accurate in the text, right? We were still in Egypt when we were told to eat the Paschal lamb with matzah. Mm. So we had more than a week after the instruction to prepare and bake regular bread, right? So it really can't be about commemorating the rush out of Egypt because nobody had to rush anywhere, which is, again, well, it let all of these interpretations live together. The Israelites had a week to prepare to eat the, the Pesach offering. So here's this person's, uh, this person, I uh, forgot his name, had this really beautiful interpretation. Here's why we eat matzah all the time, especially in the temple. We ate matzah not just on Passover. It was a regular offering in the temple. He writes, food, I'm in source number seven. Bread is arguably the most basic food that humans eat. The difference between matzah and chametz is that matzah is flour and water mixed together and cooked immediately, whereas chametz is flour mixed with water that ferments and expands. Matzah is this basic food in its unleavened, unchanged state, whereas chametz is the same food once it has begun to go through a process of change. Food is the most prominent thing that we intake completely into our bodies. It, it thus represents full acceptance. Refraining from chametz reminds us that full acceptance is not conditioned on being transformed, on being leavened mm-hmm. into better people. Mm-hmm. Rather, matzah, especially during Passover in the tabernacle, the mishkan, serves as a uh, physical reminder that we are worthy of full acceptance and love even in our unleavened state. I know that you guys like that one. Yes, that is, that's, you know, yeah. it's unconditional Leaven, love, leaven, unleavened, unloved, but un- loved for who you are without needing to be bred or to be fermented in some way. 
So I can see the therapists and others around us going, ah, that's a, that's a psycho spiritual teaching that I can. Uh, that's good. That's good. All right. We'll hold off. We'll look at. We're going to look at Maror and then Pesach. But first, uh, in the room and in the Zoom, <laughs> thoughts. Yeah, Tony. I'm reminded of three things. First of all, Rinzai, the one of the great who is most famous for saying, "If you meet the Buddha on the road, kill him," uh, and who more gently says, "Put no head above your own." Um, also, goes to a army encampment and points to a flagpole and says, "This flagpole is it sacred or profane?" Yeah. And while they're hemming and hawing, he says, "Well, it, whatever it is, it's it's a wooden flagpole." <laughs> nice. And uh, okay. And T. S. Eliot says, at the end of the <coughs> quartet, says, "A condition of complete simplicity, costing not less than everything." <laughs> And last but not least, I'm reminded of Leonard Cohen's amazing poem slash song anthem, where he says, "The Holy Dove is never free." But he goes on to provide great hope that it's still that we all come to love, but as refugees. As refugees. So I want to I, I thank you, Tony, for like more sources, beautiful sources. Um, I want to bring it back. If, if I can see if there's a there's Rachel Macleff. I want to just before Rachel you speak, I just want to connect this back to the, the conversation about Eliade's sacred profane and the seder as a reenactment. So on the one hand, we see that we're eating the matzah of our ancestors. We're actually participating in cosmic time. This moment is, as the rabbi said, we're seeing ourselves as if we ourselves rushed out of Egypt. But in the interpretive mode, where we re configure and transfigure and transform, right, the Seder Haggadah and its meaning sim its symbol set into something that is also relevant to us in the present moment. We're both participating in the circle, but also adding a piece, which is itself freedom. It's ironic, though, because I think that in this last interpretation of matzah, we're saying we don't want to change anything, just leave it as it is. But the Haggadah is the last thing that we left as it is. It is the most interpreted and most added to uh, you know, uh, rabbinic construction possibly, or liturgical construction that the rabbis ever put forth. There are, there are more interpretations for, for the Haggadah and for their elements in the Haggadah than possibly almost any other rabbinic, you know, so the matzah of the Haggadah became bread over the years, uh, continued to be rising and changing and fermenting, and it's really a beautiful balance here between those two things. Rachel, go ahead. Uh, I'm enjoying the heck out of this. Uh, I'm enjoying every word, but I just want to comment that uh, I don't know whether Arthur Rascal's writings come into Safaria or not. He's very far, uh, far out, but he has based his political organizing on the Seder for at least 50 years. And uh, he uses uh, the, the symbol of the pharaoh as the uh, symbol of forces within our current uh, social system, which uh, control uh, the amount of freedom that we actually have. That's all I wanted to say. It's very interesting. Sometimes you'll see me in a, in a pharaoh outfit with a big sign about uh, the, the fossil fuel barons. But that's all I want to go. And, I, and if you don't know that uh, because you're not into that kind of stuff, I just thought I'd comment. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, Arthur is, uh, definitely began his career with, with the Freedom Seder, which was uh, back in the 60s, where he took the Haggadah and made it very relevant to the, to the moment of civil, of civil rights in this country and on. He continues to do that in various ways. Um, we're going to look at the last piece uh, in the in this morning's sources is going to be all about the. Well, I'll give two two pieces. One is about the maror and uh, halacha about the maror, which is really beautiful. And then we'll go into uh, we'll talk about speaking and the, and the power of speech at the seder. So if you look at source um, number eight. And this is just like just think just like to feel into this conversation in the in the Talmud. The Talmud recounts that there was a there was a 
a conversation about what happens if you swallow the food without chewing it. Like, I don't know if anybody would have thought about that, but the rabbis certainly thought about it. And I think they're, like, it's not just a, a legal conversation. There's something that's obviously afoot here. Amar Rava, Rava said, Bala matza yatsa, if you swallow the matza, then you fulfill your obligation. Bala matza, I'm sorry, maror, bala maror lo yatsa. If you swallowed the maror, you didn't fulfill your obligation. Let's just stop there. The rest of it is like interesting about the. So wh- what's going on here? What do you think is going on? You have to taste. You have to taste it. Why do you have to taste the mark? Because it's, that's <coughs> the point. The bitterness is the, is the point of it. The whole point of the, right? So you, if you eat the matzah, you don't have to taste the matzah. Apparently, right? You can just... <laughs> It's unpleasant even right. if you just swallow it. It's unpleasant even when you swallow it. Yeah. Like matzah, either which way is unpleasant. So you taste it right. suffering, right? But maybe if you're eating romaine lettuce, especially if that was the original, right? We have maror horseradish, but romaine lettuce is only, right, has that bitterness after you've bitten into it to a degree. And there's something about, what, there's something about, it's just a beautiful reenactment, again, again, of cosmic time. Like, if you're just swallowing the matzah and the matzah represents freedom you're already free presumably you're not a slave so you're sort of like you're already free so it's freedom if you're eating freedom okay you're tasting it you're eating it right you don't taste it you taste it but maror suffering in this case like the the, the experience of maror is to is to give you a taste of what it was like right in in slavery like that you're suffering, okay? One has to one has to bite into the maror, okay? I think one of the most, maybe the most profound state that I think I was ever a part of was at a Zen Buddhist monastery in Brooklyn in my second year rabbinical school, my second rabbinical school, second year. And they, the participants had already, all of them been on a, a silent retreat for over a week. Uh, in the in the monastery, and so we what we went into this mock seder together, and they chewed on the moror. I'll never forget this. They must have chewed on the moror for like ten minutes. Like the first bite, they didn't. Chew, they chewed so slowly, like they they were tasting each, like each. It was it was like they wanted to be with the Buddha, like saying life is suffering, and they really wanted to. They were crying. I remember them crying for the Moro. Mm. And they weren't laughing, they were just crying. Yeah. And I don't know what they put into the Moro <clears throat> when they were chewing it. If they were imagining all the suffering in the world, you know, as if it were they had ingested all the suffering in the world, their own suffering, their own personal lives, the lives of people they loved, the lives of people they didn't know, people they met on the street. Who knows what they were meditating on? But I can tell you this, I can almost guarantee that they were not just like tasting it and going, oh. That's interesting. <clears throat> right? There was something profound happening that yeah. often in our seders we, we 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 don't really have the time almost to like we don't or maybe the people with us it's not or maybe sometimes we we're about to talk about talking. Sometimes maybe talking itself is replacing the experience that, that is invited through the ritual. Right? Maybe the ritual itself we're overlaying so many, so much talking that we don't have time or the aptitude to actually experience what what it might be inviting, you know, on some level. I don't know. Or maybe we need to come up with new foods. Like maybe we should like, I don't know, what we, maybe foods that, you know, other kinds of maror meat could be added. You know, what would be like a, a, a maror expansion? Like what would be like a maror expansion to invite the suffering of the world into our own heart and mind? suffering of our people, the suffering. This year maybe we would eat maybe something from the land of Israel. Maybe maybe we'd eat an olive and think about the suffering in the Middle East more broadly. I don't know. Something that like invites a kind of meditation on the ways of suffering and the ways of pain. But the more has to be right, the more has to be chewed in order to be Iliade to check off Iliade's box, we have to chew it and not swallow it. Right? It's an interesting 
Now, the Paschal offering is also another thing. We don't actually eat the Paschal offering um, for a whole slew of, of rabbinic reasons because we no longer we no longer have the Paschal offering, so we don't we don't uh, we don't eat it. Um, but in many ways, <clears throat> when we open the door for Elijah, I think that's a kind of moment of the Paschal offering. There's no other moment in the Seder where we actually go to the doorpost, which is where it's, it really all happened. Right? The doorpost was the, was the scariest place in, in our tradition because that was the liminal space between the safety of our home and the danger of being outside. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and the Paschal offering was our courageous moment of breaking through you know, the doorpost. A willingness to to, sac- to to make the doorpost a holy place, right? To to to, to sacralize the doorpost. Mm. So, I know this year we might think about what 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 it might represent between the inside Jew and the outside Jew, right? Between, right? You know the, the things that we can do indoors that we can't do outdoors, or, the, or or whatever whatever we might make of it. But it's 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 really to check off Eliade's box. I feel like Paschal offering has to invite us into a memory. Of the danger, of 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 being a part of another culture, whose gods, right, were we were we were persecuted for our willingness to uh, to disagree with the with that prevailing sacred object, whatever it might be. That's a kind of really powerful checking off of the box of what our of our Israelite ancestors. And I would say more, not controversially, I don't think. I mean, it shouldn't be controversial at all. But maybe this year, in a way like no other year since the Holocaust. Like the notion of the scariness for Jews at the, at the liminal space, right, mm-hmm. after October 7th, I mean, it's, it shouldn't be that much of a stretch for us to, to, to experience um, that danger at all. I think that's a kind of, you know, if you're, in Israel, if you're an Israeli living in the north, or an Israeli living in the south, or Jews who aren't living necessarily in New York, or maybe even Jews who live in New York, like this year, the Paschal offering feels very, very, uh, terrifyingly real. Um, if you're, you know, a law professor in Berkeley, who happens to also be a pro-Palestinian activist, you're also, you know, dangerously Jewish at this moment for some reason, um, you know. So there's a lot to recommend on the Paschal side of these three essential elements and to check off Eliade's box. Lastly, let's look at source 14. <clears throat> Let's look at source 13, I'm sorry, 13, to so go one, one before. It's a really simple phrase in the, that's found in the Zohar that we have spoken about so frequently in the shul, it's like every time I bring it up, I feel, uh-oh, nothing new. But it's such a beautiful image that the Zohar in the 13th century imagines that Moses, who has a problem with speech, is an archetype, a representation of the Jewish people at that time who also lacked the ability to speak. And based on a very close reading of the book of Exodus, in the beginning of the book of Exodus, where the Jews are not screaming to God with words, but with kind of almost animalistic moaning and groaning, the Zohar reads an image of exile, not just the Israelites in physical bondage, but their ability to be articulate, to speak, as also being in exile. What's known as exile of, of divor, of speech. Uh, Andre, Andre Neher is a great uh, humanist, postmodernist who wrote a book about about the exile of the word. What's the name? Neher, N-E-H-E-R. And it becomes a very common trope in the Hasidic writings. Like what's called Galut B'Dibor. B'Dibor B'Galut. Like the Galuta Dibor. Like the speech is in, like we can't find words. And the orality of the Passover Seder, the orality of the Passover Seder is not just the orality of ingestion, but, but also of articulation. And it, right, we see, if you look at source 12, right before this one, right, this is a famous part of the Haggadah, Avadim Ayinu, we were slaves, right? If God had not taken us out of Egypt, we would still be there, right? All of us are children, we would still be slaves. And even if we are Chachamim, even if we are of the sage caste, like we're the elites, We've all got PhDs, and we're all like even wise people and older people, right? Kulana yodim at the Torah, like that's a big phrase. We all know the Torah, 
Mitzvah Alinu Saper Bitziat Mitzrayim. It is still a mitzvah to tell the story of Egypt. And then it adds this gloss. The more you tell the story, the better it is. One who adds to the story, continue to add. And if we think about it in Iliade's terms, if we think about it in the doorpost, in terms of the vertical or horizontal, like for the, for the rabbis, the continued reinterpretation of the text and of time itself is the way that we revisit the past and add the future to it or the present and the future. Right? We do it through interpretive. It's like a hermeneutic of presence. Right? We are here. We're taking the past. We're reading the lens of the present through the past, but also telling the story for the sake of the future. And so it's, it's this, like, look here. If you look at source 14 in the, Hasid, in the Hasidic writings, this is from the late 19th century, early 20th century. So this is the Svas Emes. Rabbi Huda Leib Alter of Ger. You see this source 14? He says that the four cups are keneged abra lishonot shal The four cups of wine that we drink, we know that they're corresponding to, a, um, to the four verbs that God uses when God tells Moses, I will take the children of Israel out of Egypt. I will take them out, right? I will take them out, I will redeem them, I will save them, and so on. So each one of those cups relates to those four verbs. Right? So look, look at the way he works this in. It says in the Sefer Zohar, it says in the Zohar, that speech was in exile. And we know from the third century book of Yitzira that all speech has five anatomical elements, right? There are four, right? labials, dentals, right? You have the different parts of the mouth. When we say something, uh, say a word, it can, it can, we need to say it by touching different parts of the, of the, of the mouth, right? Those are called chamisha mutzot apet. The five uh, parts of the mouth, the tongue, right? The teeth, the lips, so the gutturals. So we have these five parts. That the, he said, let me show you how those five parts connect to the five, these five things in the Seder. So the teeth are clearly connected to the eating of the matzah, right? Your teeth eat the matzah, right? <laughs> Hopefully you're not swallowing it, or the, it eats the maror. The teeth are involved somehow, right, in the food. But then you have the four cups of wine are connected to the other four parts of the, of the anatomy. And all of this for him is just a symbol to say to you, right, that each element was in exile. Like when we were drinking that wine, it's as if we're bringing that part of the mouth back to life to say to it, speak your truth. Speak, almost like you can imagine like, you know, intergenerational trauma. You can bring Gabor Mate here. You can bring like, you know, the, the body speaks. You could have Reza, you know, mm -hmm. coming in. And say like, oh, this is like, we are telling the parts of the body that were silenced, come alive. Tell us what you have to say. He sees all four of these cups of wine and the eating itself as a, as a practicum for the mouth to speak its truth, right? Come out and speak. Yeah. And he goes over this, over and again. It's, it's the same teaching in the next, in the next moment, in, in Source 15. He says, the speaking mouth, Pesach, right? In a kol mitzvah, laila zebepeh. Every mitzvah on, at the Seder table is about the mouth. You tell the story, you eat, you drink. Because he says, ultimately, the Jewish people's power is in their mouth. <laughs> their strength is in their oh, mouth. That's beautiful. <laughs> Rachel. Thanks, Rachel. Your strength is also you know. demo. demo. Exactly. It's like what? To introduce the arguments. He says that when a child begins to speak, they start to teach the child Torah. Right. This is in his world. Right. And he says that beginning to speak, and then you teach them Torah. That is really the model here. We begin, we begin to find our voice again after years of, of slavery in Egypt. And the Seder tells us that story, but it's, all of it is just a, 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 a preparation to receive holy words. Like we start speaking and complaining, I wrote in here at one point, fetching and complaining and fighting. Like, you know, we have the power to do all of that too with our mouth. And so, certainly Passover has a lot of different speech acts. But ultimately he connects it now to the receiving of Torah. We, the ability to speak is the freedom from silence, but it isn't yet the highest expression of speech. Maybe poetry, maybe Torah. Like last night we had a poetry evening. Like he says, like being, freeing our mouths to speak at the Seder is 
a vital precondition for being able to one day fill it with words of praise, which is, he says, the reason why at the Seder table we don't just tell the story of our being in, in exile, but we also have Dayenu and gratitude and Hallel, which is like a, the praising of God. We toggle back and forth between the use of the mouth to, to change reality and the use of the mouth to honor and praise reality. Those two things toggle back and forth, like the matzah meanings, like the vertical and the horizontal, it all is playing out, like the chametz and the matzah. I would, lastly, I would, I would, I would end in, um, no, I'll end in a second. Any comments? We have about 10 minutes before I have to go over. Tomas, people in the room, in the Zoom. Just, I can't resist bringing in, we talked about transubstantiation, which is the $50 word in Catholicism for the ritual of taking, 50? you know, $49. It's up there. Uh, uh, it's up there. For, for taking the little matzah at the Mass. And every Catholic Mass, every Sunday, speaking of cycles and reenactments, is a reenactment of a Seder. Because the famous Last Supper on Thursday night before Easter was the Passover Seder. Um, so every Catholic Mass, the essential miracle is just uh, the, the, the bread and the wine. And the bread becomes, if you believe, the body of Christ, and the wine becomes the blood of Christ. Um, it's an extraordinarily intimate and impossible um, miracle of transubstantiation. But every single Sunday is Passover for Catholics. Um, yeah, and they tag one, so. right? Yeah, yeah. Without the cleaning, so they can yeah. kill the Jews. We like yeah. have Passover every Sunday without the cleaning. No preparation, no preparation right? Better yes, for worse. Uh, but but the only cosmic joke in what we think of it in terms of um, um, the chewing is is instead of a bar mitzvah, if you're Catholic, you have a first communion, um, mm. which is when you're 13. You take this little. Um, mm. It's called the host, right? Like host guest, the host mm. of the spirit, mm. which is this little circular mini matzo. And the, the cosmic joke is that that host, it's disgusting. Mm -hmm. Like, it's dry, it's bitter, like, you do not want to taste it. It is just, it is not delicious. Um, and at your first communion, the instruction is not to chew it, but to simply rest it on your tongue until it dissolves. Mm -hmm. So you're tasting and you're tasting and you're tasting mm -hmm. um, in silence. Um, and I think it's Thomas Merton who talks about the relationship between tasting and speaking. Mm. Um, like this, the two things the tongue does mm. um, across the threshold of the mouth mm. and of what passes your lips. Mm. And so the world, the material world comes into your mouth and then it goes back out through the abstraction of speech. And he talks about this eating and speaking as relating to transubstantiation. But anyway, the joke is that you have to just sit there, your first communion when you're 13, and taste this bitter, bitter, bitter thing, mm. um, and the the um, the wisdom supposedly in it is because of the way that the body works. All those carbohydrates, if you sit with them for long enough, become sweet. Mm. So if you can sit with the bitter, yeah. chalky horribleness mm. of that host, which I <laughs> mm. um, in theory it becomes sweet, mm. um, and supposedly that's why you have the teaching of the first communion. After the first communion, you just Get it over with you as, get as possible. Well, I, so it's like, um, so I, I want to add to that, which is to say that you just, I think the insight that you just provided for me was that I think that for the rabbis, the transubstantiation actually happens not turning the matzah and turning the blood into the body of Christ, but the turning the blood of the sacrifice and into the words of yes. the sacrifice. Yes. So for us, it's kind of funny, like in the way that, the way that the New Testament worked with the, the problem of language, which is to call God, right, in the beginning was the word. But for us, um, it's also true, but it really, it was absolutely true, the beginning was the words of the Torah, but later on, without the concrete um, ingesting of concrete reality, we turned the blood of the doorposts into the Torah yeah. of the mezuzah, right? So literally the words. Literally, the becomes a, right. So, mm -hmm. so something about the, the Seder also becomes for the rabbis, a great practicum in rabbinic methods, the rabbinic way. And the rabbinic way was, right, you eat, you know, parts of it you were eating, parts of it you were ingesting, but also the story around it was absolutely essential mm -hmm. because for them it was all about, that's why the five rabbis are talking about the Seder until morning, right? And the, it, it would, had their student not interrupted them and told them to go say Shema, they would have kept talking. 
which is another way of saying that the Shema, which is the affirmation of God's unity, would have been subverted and, and would have been glossed over by the rabbinic act of adding Torah to Torah, being God. Right? They were being God by adding Torah, and they were like continuing to talk about that, like that's what the rabbis imagined for themselves that they were writing a new Torah. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, that audacity also, which is to see the present moment as no less significant than the cosmic, is the ultimate, right? The ultimate add-on to Eliade's truth is that we come to this moment and we know it exactly as the, the next Passover. It's the next Pharaoh. Hamas is a pharaoh in our in our heart and mind, like no doubt. Like we don't think this is a sweet gender. Like this is just another cosmic moment of pharaonic, you know, not just you know Exxon, but actual pharaohs, meaning who are killing babies and so on. And then we add onto it our own truth, and we add our interpretations, and that way we also participate in the unfolding of Torah. I'll just say this last thing, and then I, Mom should have to go that my friend Micha Goodman, Dr. Micha Goodman is a, is a philosopher in Israel. I've talked about him on a number of occasions. He just wrote a book about, uh, that's become a bestseller in Israel called Hayom HaShemini, The Eighth Day, um, which is, of course, a, a mil, you know, there are millions of puns about it. It's October 7th and October 8th is the eighth day. It, wow. happened, on the, it happened on the eighth day of, of, uh, of Shemini Atzeret. And he said that one of the things that has emerged from October 7th in a way that nothing else could have ever created was that, you know, if you're a fifth, sixth generation Israeli, you, you don't have no idea what it felt like to live in a world where Israel didn't exist and that you needed Israel. <clears throat> but the founders of Israel needed Israel. <laughs> out of, out of, out of the, the ashes of the, of the Shoah, like the founders were, you know, Israel was an absolute necessity, and, and they transmitted that to the second and third generation. If you were a second and third generation Israeli, you knew about Israel, you know, you knew about 48 from your parents, you might have been there for 57, you definitely were maybe serving during 67, but then after 73, right, in the, in the, in, you know, in the last 40 years, he said that the next generation is kind of like, they took Israel for granted in every imaginable way. He said, you know, literally hundreds of thousands of Israelis have left Israel over the last 40 years, who would have thought that Berlin would have one of the most popular Israel, like communities of Israelis in the world? Mm -hmm. It's like crazy. It's absolutely unimaginable. And he said, "What happened on October 7th is that those those uh, the country remembered what it was like before we had an army. Remember what it was like before we had defense because 